Hello, friends of sophisticated color grading. I'm happy to see some of you are joining me again live today. And as usual, please ask questions via the chat or comment below the video if you're watching the recording of this session. Okay, let's begin. Today, we will cover the basics of transforms. I will talk mostly about the transform operator and later a little bit about the edge crop operator. But I want to start a little bit unconventional by telling you what not to do with the transform operator. So here we have a shot that has an input format of 4096 by 2160. And my scenes working format is 1920 1080 and also my viewing format is 1920 1080. So this shot is not covering the full working format and viewing format at the moment. So I will insert full area guides to make this more obvious. So you can see these black letter boxes here, top and bottom. And one could use the transform operator, the shortcut is shift T to insert it, to zoom that shot in a little bit to cover the whole format. But this is more like a technical transform to map a certain kind of footage to our project. And from the philosophy of Baselight, this technical transform shouldn't be applied with the transform operator. So I delete that operator now. It should be done with a formats mapping. We will cover that in other lessons, but I will just show you quickly how this would be done in this case, if I want to cover the whole working format here. So I convert the basic format, I create a new one, I go to formats, choose my format, select mappings, new, I select a working format. And now I switch to outside mapping. We can see, so now we're cropping a little bit on the left and right, but we are filling the whole format now. Okay, let's move to the transform operator. In the transform operator, we have a set of parameters and those adjust the transform of the image. So we can translate the image on the X axis or Y axis. We can scale the image, we can rotate it, and we can also adjust, for example, the pivot point of the transform. This will then affect, for example, the scale or the rotation of the transform. If you don't want to use these sliders, you can use your grading panel, try the trackballs and rings to adjust the transform, or you can use your mouse cursor here directly on the image. If I grab that red circle in the center here, I can move the image around. If I hold down command or control while clicking on that circle, I can move the pivot point around. So I can move the pivot point, for example, over here. Then when I grab one of these red handles here on that red circle, I can rotate. Let's reset that. And let's have a look at the borders of the image. There's also a red overlay here. When I grab one of these circles here in the corners, I can scale the image. And per default, this will maintain the aspect ratio of the image. But if I hold down command control while clicking on that, I can also change the aspect ratio. And when I grab here one of these borders, again, I can scale the image. And if I hold down command control, I can adjust just one axis of the scale. Here, the horizontal one, or here, the vertical one. Okay, let's reset all that. For the scale, we can see here there are gang buttons. So per default, X and Y scale are ganged. Now I ungang them to bring them both back to the default value of one, and I can reactivate the gang. On the bottom here, we can flip and flop the image. And typically this is done with the whole image as a center, but I have prepared 
a common top mask for the image, which I overlay as a guide. And now if I use that one as a reference, you can see that the flip is now considering that mask that I chose here for the whole image. It will look like that. If the range of a slider is not sufficient, then you can activate extended ranges and you will have a larger range for all of the sliders. On the next shot, I want to explain an important point, and that is the difference between zooming into the image with the GUI and using a transform operator. So here we have an 8K source image, but we're working on it and viewing it only in HD resolution. When I zoom in here in the GUI, I'm zooming into the HD image that would be rendered out if we would use that HD format on the render page as a render format. Now I'm adding a transform and let's also zoom in on that climber here. I'm using extended ranges to zoom in a lot. Let me create a second cursor to compare both methods. Now I have cursor 2 that will bypass the transform. I ensure that zoom pan ganging is deactivated and I use a 2 by one layout here. So on the left we see the image zoomed in via the transform operator and on the right we are now zooming in without the transform operator just in the GUI. Let me also zoom in here a little bit to compare the image better. And so here you see a clear difference. The transform operator here on the left side uses the full resolution of the underlying 8K source image to reframe it in the timeline. And here on the right side, without the transform operator, we're really zooming into the pixels that would be rendered out in an HD render format. That is a very important point to understand. If you don't like these red overlays on the image, you can deactivate them here with that overlays toggle. This will deactivate overlays for all transform strips in the scene. As an alternative for screenings, you can deactivate all overlays for all operators, also shapes, for example, here in the cursor. So far, we only worked with the image page of the transform operator, but there's a second page, the camera page. And this one has the controls reversed. The idea is that this page simulates a virtual camera on a tripod head filming the scene. I noticed in the past that DPs often give directions about reframings in that logic. So they might say pan to the left and they actually mean the image should move to the right. On the top right, there's a global reset for the page. And another use case for that camera page is organization of your transforms. So you might do an animated move for a creative reframe on the image page and using keyframes here, and then you can go to the camera page, for example, to add a global zoom in onto the image on that page. Let's reset that as well. So the main purpose of the transform operator is to perform creative reframings on the images. Let's do a little bit of rotation here. But one common issue while reframing is not filling the full output format, like here. I already showed you the full area guides, which can be helpful in that scenario. Here you can see we introduced some black background here in the bottom left and top right. But there's also an alternative to that, which is in the display menu, and it's called transform alarm overlay. We can activate that here, and you can change the color of the transform alarm overlay also in the display menu. On the next shot, I want to show you another way to control the transform operator. First, I ensure in that numeric keypad mode is set to grading. And now I can use the numeric keypad on my keyboard to control 
the transform. For example, with the numbers 4 and 6, I can move the image 10 pixels left and right. If I hold down Command, I can move single pixels in each direction. The same is true with moving up and down. These are the numbers 8 and 2. With the number 5, I can reset the whole page. With numbers 1 and 3, I can zoom into the image or zoom out. And with numbers 7 and 9, I can rotate the image. With the divide button, I can switch between camera and image page. Okay, let's reset that page one more time with button 5. On that shot, we want to even out the horizon. It's not really horizontal here. And what usually helps in that scenario is overlaying a grid. So there's a toggle directly in the transform operator. We can turn that on and off. There are some people also prefer to overlay a certain guide, for example, or other people like to overlay uh, a graticule over the image. But I will show you my preferred method and that is just clicking into the image in the transform operator and this will give us a white horizontal and vertical line and these we can just align with some features in the image and then we can start to manipulate the transform. Maybe something like this. Now I think it's a little bit too far so I move it slightly back in the opposite direction. Yeah, maybe something like this. Especially with these kind of rotations, we often run into the problem of revealing black areas in our image. So we need to zoom into the image a little bit to fill the working format again. Luckily in the transform operator on the camera page, there's a special button for that, which automates that process. It's labeled remove image borders. I click that button and the transform operator zooms in just the required amount to cover the original size of the image again. So if I go back to the rotation and if I in introduce a larger rotation, now we have a really strong zoom in on the image. But if I reduce the rotation again to a more moderate amount and if I click the button one more time, we can see the operator is also so smart to zoom the image out to the just required amount to cover the original size. On the next shot, I want to show you that the order of operations is important. Here we have two shapes applied to the shot. Here in layer two, we are darkening a little bit that book here. And in layer three, we are brightening the background to even out the light levels in the shot. If I now apply a transform above in my stack and for example zoom in a little bit and move here to the right side, then we will notice that shapes are not at the right positions anymore. Now that layer for the book has almost no effect and that's because the shape is in the wrong position. That is the reason why transforms should typically applied at the bottom of the stack. Let me do that now. I hold down the Alt key and move the transform strip all the way to the bottom. Now you will notice that the shapes are again in the right position. That means when you use operators that transform the image, you should typically apply them at the bottom of your stack. Also, when I now insert a new layer in the stack here above and add a new shape, we can see that it's automatically drawn at the right position. So the transform is always taken into account. Let's step through the stack once to give you a better understanding. Here we have the ungraded image. This is a base correction. Here we can see the shape of the book is positioned 
on the original untransformed image. The same happens here with the shape of the background. Then we have our look layers and finally the transform is applied and everything sits at the right position. On the next shot, I want to show you that transforms in Baselight are concatenated. What does that mean? I give you an example. I add a transform strip to that shot. Let's turn off our transform alarm overlay. And first I will make that shot here very, very small. Let's go with an even number of 10% of the original size. So this is now scaled down heavily. I add a layer below, add a shape. Let's say we add a very small shape here to the peak of the mountain. And let's do something there. I don't know. Let's tint it warm. And then below we add another transform strip. And I want to invert that previous transform. So I just go to the camera page because there also the scale is working in a reverted way. Think of it more like a field of view. And I type in the same number, 0.1 which brings the image back to the original size. And when we zoom in, you will notice if I bypass just the two transform strips, we have zero quality loss and zero change on the image. Still, the shape is at the correct position where we drew it in that small version here. Of course, the position of the shape changes if I bypass both of the transform strips. But what you should realize is that base light under the hood analyzes all the transforms required for a given shot and applies them all at once. So basically it realizes that these two transforms even themselves out and it just recalculates the position of the shape to bring that to the right position on the image. So this is something that makes technical people like me sleep well at night. Let's get rid of these strips and have a look at another button in the operator. And this is apply camera scale last. It is relevant only in edge cases. So we need to perform an uneven scale on the image. So let's say we're doing a different scale for X and Y axis and we add a little bit of a rotation on the image. And typically the order of operations is that the camera scale, so the scale here on the camera page is always applied last to the image. So the rotation is applied first, then the scale currently. If I uncheck that button, it will apply the scale first and then the rotation. And you can see that this makes a difference on the image under these very specific conditions. But that's enough for now. The next topic is the quality of the image transform. In Baselight, there are multiple image transform algorithms available. The default one is called adaptive, but there are also other typical ones like cubic or Gaussian available. If I hold down shift, there are even more methods available to transform the image. Very quickly, these different options change the method how pixels are transformed from one raster to another raster. And the cubic one here, for example, is known to be sharper, but also more vulnerable to image artifacts. The Gaussian one is softer, but at the same time, more robust against artifacts. My advice is to use the adaptive method and a sharpness level of one or something a little bit below one. My personal preference is a sharpness level of 0.8 as a starting point for a project, but this then really depends on the kind of footage and the project. But we will cover the implications of these parameters in more depth in another session. I set this back to one and close the panel. I just want to show you one important example regarding image transforms and that is dealing with text. Here I comped white text onto that image. Let's examine the borders in a little bit more detail. So I zoom into our image here and we can see there's a little bit of stepping around the text. 
for graphics, titles or other computer generated images where we have very sharp transitions between individual pixels, my general advice is to always scale them in linearized color space. So what we can do is for a single shot or even a single asset in our stack, we can change the image transform settings from the default that we set in the scene settings. So here we set the default image transform for all the shots. And inside layer zero of every shot, you will find the image transform settings parameters. Here we can override that default. So I can need to enable that override option here. Now I can change that just for that text here. And generally my advice is for these kind of graphics to use linearized color treatment. And what you can see is we have a much smoother response here for that white text on the image. I turn it on and off again. I think that really makes some difference. And on top of that, we can also adjust the sharpness with that adaptive algorithm. So for example, if we want it even smoother, we can move that slider here to the left side and reduce the sharpness of that image transform even further. Like so, I would say. Now we have a before and after. And the nice thing is this doesn't affect the background image here. So let's go to a sharp area. So if I change that, we can see the background image stays untouched. And that background image has its own image transform settings here that I could enable or disable here individually. Okay, the last thing I want to show today is the edge crop operator. I insert it here from the transforms menu. And with the edge crop, as the name suggests, we can crop the image by a given amount of pixels, left, right, top, and bottom. We can also define the color level of that crop. But when you watched our color management tutorials, you know that this is applied in the working color space. So in order to see that, I would need to have a look at the image in the working color space. But typically you leave that at hard black zero. If you want to apply a crop to a common aspect ratio, you can select from a set of preset aspect ratios here that are available for every viewing format. Or you can also select all the masks that we have available in our current viewing format as a crop target. So let's say I select 2.4 aspect ratio here and it, and it applies the crop accordingly. And this also works for our custom 239 common top mask for example, if we want to crop to that mask. Please note that the crop is always based on the current viewing format, but is actually calculated in the working format. And so that means when I change the viewing format to a different one that might contain different kind of masks, always the same pixels are cropped as defined when I hit that button here. Okay, that's it for now. Okay, again, this was a lot of content in that session. I hope it was helpful. There are actually two things I want to mention. And one is that I avoided one topic completely, which is also a common task for the transforms operator, and that is stabilizing shots. So this is a topic that we will cover also in one of the more um, advanced tutorials, probably in the, in the intermediate courses. So this is also something that you can do with the transform operator. And another thing I want to show you quickly about the image transform settings uh, with the titles is, so with that hint that I showed you to optimize the performance here with these titles, you can, you can run into a problem, and that is if the 
if the text isn't transformed at all. So in that case, now we have the input text is 1920-1080, scene format is 1920-1080, and also viewing format is 1920-1080. So, and also no transform applied at all to the text. So that means now the image transform settings should not have any effect because the image is not transformed. Yeah, we can see that here. If you have that problem and you still want to use maybe a nicer method here for that clip, then just transform the, the image by moving it, for example, by one pixel. So now it's moving one pixel and now you can see the image transform settings have an effect now as before. So this is a small workaround for these kind of cases where you might want to use an extra soft um, transform method for graphics. Okay, thanks for um, yeah listening today and see you next time. Mm -hmm.